Uh, good morning. Good to be with all of you today. Good to be back. Uh, before we uh, start with prayer, there's donuts up here. So somebody had a birthday and uh, someone's... Reverend Watt. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so thank you for bringing the donuts. Appreciate it. Um, so we get started. Uh, prayer requests for today. My mother-in-law. Her name is Anne. She's progressing very fast with dementia and Alzheimer's. Sure. Friendship Bible study kicked off last night that uh, St. John and Trinity are doing together, so praise for that. Um, it's, it's heavy on my heart that that little girl was killed in IPS last night by, by a, when she was getting on and off the bus. I think that's the second one in two weeks in Indianapolis. But um, prayers for angry drivers. You know, just the just angry, angry world. It's just, yeah. Rick, she caught you. No, I can get you one, though. Well, uh, continued prayers for Julie uh, Klopke. She, she went home on Sunday, um, but she's still... Uh, under the weather, she's doing much better, but uh, I, I don't think she'll be back here for quite a while yet. Um, so the prayers that she continues to recover from COVID. It was pretty scary there for a while. Um, and prayers for our school teachers. They're going on a field trip to a baseball game today. So uh, a, a few innings at least. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the Lord be with the teachers today. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> Any other prayer requests? On a prayer request of, of Thanksgiving for myself, uh, with all of my apartment issues and excitement, that's all going very well. Um, had a cleaning party and a moving party this week, and that, so I'm very grateful for all the people that have really helped me out with all of that. Um, the Lord is gracious and merciful. Uh, this could have been a million times worse, so um, I'm just very grateful uh, that I still have things, and uh, I'm alive, and my cats are alive. So, yeah. So, um, and I still got to go on vacation. So, I only lost two days of vacation. So, uh, well, let us pray. <clears throat> uh, dear Lord Jesus, so we uh, come before you today with uh, several prayer requests. Uh, we we thank you for this day, and uh, thank you for this time uh, to dive into your Word and to have fellowship and uh, with one another and to study your Word. Uh, we lift up to you uh, those uh, who are uh, sick and ill. We especially pray for Anne and Julie, that you would uh, give them uh, healing and recovery, but uh, be with those who care for them, uh, that, uh, that give them an extra measure of your strength and mercy to, to care for. Uh, we pray for our school as they go on a field trip today. I ask that you bless uh, this uh, opportunity to enjoy the baseball game. Uh, be with the teachers. Give them an extra measure of patience and mercy and grace uh, as they uh, uh, undergo this uh, field trip. Uh, we pray for the Friendship Bible Study that St. John is, is partnering with uh, Trinity, that uh, you would uh, care for uh, those folks that are participating in this study, uh, that uh, your love and grace would abound in all of that. Uh, we pray for uh, the, the girl, the IPS girl that was killed. Uh, we ask that you would be with her family, wrap your loving arms around them. Uh, we also pray for uh, our world, uh, as there is a lot of anger uh, in that uh, uh, the anger of man does not produce righteousness. And so uh, we ask that you would uh, bring the peace that only comes uh, in and through you. And finally, Lord, uh, I pray a uh, prayer of thanksgiving for uh, the situation with my apartment, uh, for all the hands that have helped uh, me with that situation from our flock here at St. John, and uh, that, uh, that you are gracious and merciful even in the midst of uh, bad things, and that uh, you are still a good Lord, uh, even when things go bad. So we thank you for this day, and thank you for all the many good gifts that you give us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ron Wampner says, uh, prayer of thanksgiving for make, making Wisconsin so beautiful. So. We need to sing this verse anymore. Now? Should we sing it now? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. 
God's blessings to you. God's blessings to you. God's blessings to you. God's blessings to you. How old are you? <laughs> 35. 35. Well, thank you. Uh, you. You sang it better than the youth group did on Sunday. So, uh, hey, I was a part of that group, too. Uh, you were. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, no, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, I did have a good birthday. It was busy. Probably not the way I would like to spend a birthday. Uh, hang, cleaning smoke soot. But uh, uh, it was good. It was fun. So. Uh, so, we are still in John chapter 10 today. Uh, I assume that's what you, you did. Say last we week. are still, yeah, you, because you are here. Yeah, yeah, so, you yeah, all are in cha are. John chapter ten. We'll let you come along. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the uh, the Good Shepherd text. Um, I believe last week you covered the first sixteen verses or so. Uh, so we'll yeah. recap some of that, but then we're going to jump to verses uh, twenty seven through thirty, uh, where Jesus continues uh, the Good Shepherd. Um, speech talk. Uh, so, for recap, let's uh, let's begin with verse uh, eleven. <clears throat> so, John chapter ten, verse eleven. Jesus said, "I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf come coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them." He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. So we'll pause there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's the gospel of the Lord. This is the gospel of Praise the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are these words actually, are yeah. they in red? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so as we recap, uh, anything, well, what did you talk about last week? I did not go back and watch the talked about Jesus. Jesus, okay. I don't know, let's add, we'll open it up to, there's more. Yeah. People, uh, anybody remember anything from last week? <laughs> <laughs> Who's the other? The other, yeah, the one flock? No, no, yeah, the, I have other sheep. Yeah, that's what I was. Yeah, Pastor Luke, who is it? Now, I gave you a little preview, so do you have an answer for this? We didn't get a real straight answer last week. Huh? The answer was, I don't know, but we, I think we eliminated, <laughs> we eliminated universalism as uh, that it's everyone, regardless of whether they believe or not. But then um, we threw out, could it be uh, the Jews or Israel? Um, I don't know, other, other stuff now. My initial thought is that Jesus is referencing the Gentiles. Um, I'd have to do some more digging. But that sounds like that, a pretty good that, answer. That's my initial yeah. reaction. I like that answer. Um, or maybe it's just <clears throat> there are other people who are yet to believe. Um, so maybe Jesus is talking about us. Um, he's looking ahead 2,000 years to Christians at St. John Lutheran Church, and we are the other sheep that he's referencing. Maybe the sheep of his pasture, the people of his hand. Yeah. Or the. Yeah. I felt fed by because those outside Judaism. Okay. Is what they're. The Gentiles. That would be. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so that yeah, yeah that's again my my initial thought that. Um, Jesus is referencing those outside of. The nation of Israel. So the people of Israel. Well, and thank God that he uh, seeks the other sheep. Uh, I'm pretty sure that would include all of us, <laughs> most of us probably. Uh -huh. <clears throat> that uh, the love of God, Jesus wants to be a shepherd of all. Jesus longs to be the shepherd of all. And he wants to bring everyone into his flock. And so praise God for that. I don't know if we talked about this last week about Jesus says, I know my own. I know my own and my own know me. Anybody got any thoughts on that? I think it has to do with the saying, I am his and he is mine. Does anybody like that? Dislike it? Wow. You guys have a lot of energy today. 
Pastor Luke's back. Low energy. <laughs> Peggy. Um, I do have a thought. Um, because of the time, the setting, that this was um, the technology we have today, you have to imagine shepherds out in the fields at night, in the dark, no light, you, and, and just how very dangerous that could be. Another Bible study I was in talked about how at that time, the way the shepherds would be with their flocks, and you know, each shepherd would call his own, and they would follow him, but at night, they would all come to like an enclosure out in the open, the sheep would go in, but there was no gate. The shepherds would lay down across mm. the opening, and they were the gate. So I just thought that was an interesting thought. And I didn't know, I mean, do they still do that kind of thing? You've been to Israel. I didn't know if you had seen anything like that. I don't think so. <laughs> Not to my knowledge. I did in Iraq see a lot of shepherds and sheep, got shepherds with uh, goats and sheep, and they would walk them across busy highways and stuff like that. So um, I don't know that I saw much of that in Israel, but I did see it quite a bit in Iraq. So uh, again, our, the context that we are studying this in is a, a funeral text, and so uh, when Jesus says, I know my own and my own know me, uh, what a great comfort that is for uh, the, ba the dead, those who are baptized and have died, that even in death, they still, are, they still belong to the good shepherd. Um, and Jesus still knows them even in their death. Um, and we'll, we'll get to this later in the chapter, but they are still in the good shepherd's hands. Uh, even in the midst of something as awful as death. Jesus still knows his own. They still belong to him. Well, it's a two-way street also, though. So, I mean, at, at a funeral, it is not merely that Jesus knows them. Uh, they, they actively still know him. They, they know their Redeemer lives. They know their Good Shepherd lives. They know that right now in the present tense. Because it is... In that, and that's we. I think we've talked about this before. Like, I know who Carson Wentz is, the quarterback of the Colts. He does not know who I am. So, um, well, he should. Well, I am pretty important, but uh, <laughs> it's just a matter of time. I'm kind of a big deal. But uh, uh, it, it, that there is something to to being known by this one uh, as well, and not just known. Oh yeah, there's that. That's that. It's that lady. No, I know her by name. I've called her by name, and she is mine. That that is a. Uh, it is the knowing and being known, and then, um, the beauty of it. This side of of uh, Christ's return, or or we die and are asleep in Jesus, is He knows us and loves us in spite of the fact that we, like sheep, have gone astray, and we kick at one another. And bite at one another. Yeah, and uh, you know that the good shepherd knows us by name. We were, uh, you know, just on Sunday we baptized. I, I can't. What is that music? <laughs> what? Uh, it's like a theme song or something. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, All right. We'll start over. Uh, know that the good shepherd knows knows his own by name. On Sunday, second service, we baptize, or you baptized Bailey. You baptized Bailey in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and when we walk through the funeral liturgy, I mean, so much of the funeral liturgy uh, mirrors the baptismal liturgy. Um, and so, yes, the Good Shepherd calls us by name in our baptism, and he continues to know us and call us by name even in, uh, in our death. That's why you can ever be glad at heart, yeah. because close beside you, he gently guides you. Yeah. He loves you every day the same, even when you're a doofus. Yeah, and, uh, and for those, I mean, as you said, the, 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 the Christian who has died, they're not mourning. Uh, they know their Savior, uh, but uh, that reality is, is comforting for us 
in the midst of when we are grieving the death of a loved one, um, that, you know, even when we are grieving and sad and maybe angry, all those things that the good shepherd still calls us by name. Uh, even when maybe we're really ticked off at God, that God took our mother or our spouse or whatever it might be. Um, why did my child die? Uh, I don't even love Jesus right now. Um, but even in the midst of that, the good shepherd still holds on to us and clings to us and uh, calls us personally by our name. Amen. It's all very relational. Yeah. Well, and um, verses, looking at verses 14, 15, what we've been talking about. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. And then Jesus, he makes this uh, turn, and I find it kind of interesting. Why does Jesus do this? And he does it, and we'll see this again uh, in, uh, later in the chapter, verse 15. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Um, it's kind of interesting. Jesus is talking about his relationship with his flock, uh, but then he brings in the Father. Uh, which see, I, I think it's, it feels kind of like strange to me. Why is he bringing in the father here? Because he is a mirror of the fatherly heart. And he, so he's saying, we have this relationship. My father and I have this relationship. It is of the same essence or spirit quality, I think. Mm -hmm. And he says he lays down his life. Any other thoughts on why bring the Father, God the Father, into this, this conversation here? Paul. Maybe to emphasize the personal relationship between a father and son. Mm -hmm. You just got done comparing, you know, the sheep and the shepherd. It's just maybe there's, he's trying to connect. Yeah. You know, that, it, that it's a very, very close mm -hmm. um, and it's even with, with the listing part and all that, you know, the communication is close. Right? The father and the son should know each other pretty well. Yeah. Should recognize each other's voice. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's there's maybe a lot of ways to to go there with that idea. Yeah. The well, the father and the son have a perfect relationship with another. God the Father and God the Son have a perfect relationship with another. They love each other. Uh, greatly, and they know each other. Um, and uh, Jesus is saying that just as they know each other, Jesus then knows uh, knows his own sheep. Um, so there is, I, I think, our relationship with Jesus in some ways, not completely the same, but in some ways, in some measure, mirrors that of the relationship between the Father and the Son. Bob? Uh, Paul nailed it and em emulating that relationship because also God gave us freedom of choice. And so Jesus died because he chose to obey the Father. Mm -hmm. So that freedom of choice, he's emulating that even though he could have not gone to the cross, but he chose to obey the Father in that relationship. Yeah, uh, Jesus perfectly obeys the Father's will. It was it was the Father's will that Jesus die on the cross um, for our sake, and Jesus perfectly obeyed, submitted to the Father's will. Um, and actually, uh, in G in, in Jesus' submission to the Father, uh, we see man or human beings as they should be, willingly submitting to the Father's will, even if the Father's will is crucifixion and death for somebody that doesn't know jesus to think that the humans forced him against his will to go to the cross well there is that kind of there is that because there, there's different angles to it because in acts peter is very clear when he's spe uh, preaching to the jews you killed the lord of life um and so there is this fact that Yes, human beings betrayed, beat up, flogged, crucified, mocked, spit upon, and murdered the author of life. Um, but that was still the Father's, uh, 
the Father's will. Um, so there is this, yes, it was the Father's will that Jesus would die, but it was also sinful human beings, us included, nailed the Lord, our Lord to the cross. I just wonder, do you think, we just don't really know the answer, do you think Jesus really had a choice? I mean, God is God. I, I, I've always thought he probably didn't have, he submitted it, sure. Mm -hmm. But I just, it's just like, did, did Judas really have a choice? Yeah. I, I don't think so. I think it was part of the plan. I, I don't know. It's a sticky wicket, that whole free will thing. Yeah, uh, it yeah. is. Because I've I, I, I got a couple thoughts, but I'll, I'll save mine. Rick, read. He didn't have a choice. This prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Well, God is free. Well, let's stick with God. God is free to do whatever he wants. Um, so God has, has freedom in a way that we really don't. Um, so uh, we, we need to be careful when we think about our freedom, whatever way we talk about that, and linking it directly to God's, uh, because we are not on the same level as God. Um, even even uh, the God-man, Jesus, we are not at the same level. Well, you'd say the only choice ultimately you can make is to disobey. <clears throat> you yeah. can't make a choice to, to follow. But I, I, So I think I figured this out, what you all were talking about <laughs> here. Uh, well, please enlighten me. Uh, well, starting with what Paul uh, Johnson said. So th this relationship between the Father and the Son, the Father is a good shepherd. The Son, in addition to being the shepherd, paradoxically, is also the Lamb. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he is both shepherd and sheep. So then if you go to the Psalms, Psalm 95, the Venite, uh, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So he is saying, he, he is in the middle as both a shepherd and the sheep. And he is saying, my father is a good shepherd. And he takes care of his people, and he will claim his people. Uh, and so he, he comes to, to do that. So I think there is, there is a both and happening there. Uh, at the same time. So where the the nation of Israel, like sheep, went astray, he did not go astray. So now he this intimacy is is one of an intimacy he has with the Father, but he also has an intimacy with you and me because he is also a sheep. But he's a perfect sheep who uh, is completely righteous. So I I mean there's seventeen hundred sermons uh, in this text. At least, and I'm going to preach a few of them right now. <laughs> Peggy, um, does the question touch on then um, in John 17:20 when Jesus had prays for all believers? Um, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. So it's it's that whole the Father and the Son, the Son because of the Son, we have that intimacy with the Father, mm -hmm. and it's all God's doing. Well, you must have the Holy Spirit, but other than yes. that, well, I'll give you an A. It's because of the yeah. Holy Spirit. Right, exactly. Yeah. Now, okay, now you get an A. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's actually here, and in the, the verses 27, there is a, quite a bit of Trinitarian theology, uh, which I really enjoy. Uh, because I don't get it. I'm pretty sure uh, it's in the whole scripture. Oh yeah, oh, but uh, okay. uh, and more, it's more explicit here. But yes, um, we only have a relationship with God the Father because it's been restored through Christ and 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 by the working of the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you remember a year and a half ago when I preached on Trinity Sunday, I drew that diagram with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It was so good. How could I forget? <laughs> yeah, in uh, this. I mean, the technical term for this is the economic trinity. It simply means this is how God relates to his creation. This is how God works to love and care for and save us. He does this by the Father sending the Son, and the Son sends the Spirit. The Spirit connects us to Jesus or to the Son, and the, the Son brings us to God the Father. Um, I mean, this is, this is what happened in our baptism. The Father sent the Son. The Son sends the Spirit. The Spirit connects us to Christ. He connect, brings us to the Father. This is how God relates to us. And we're seeing this played out. Now, the Holy Spirit isn't mentioned here, but the Holy Spirit is at work uh, through, through Christ's word here. Um, <clears throat> I took a, uh, a master's level class on just the Trinity, 
And I think what I learned from that is just how much I don't understand the Trinity. Um, I've been teaching the seventh graders on the Trinity and I've threatened to three or four of them to burn them at the stake for Trinitarian heresy. I, so I will talk to the district after this. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. But I, I misspoke about something in the Trinity, so I got to burn myself at the stake too. So um, it's fun. Your whole self or just your feet? Oh, we'll see. Okay. We'll see. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, I, a Trinitarian theology, I think sometimes it, like it actually is really exciting to me because in the way it seems kind of dry and dusty, but this is actually how God loves us. The Trinitarian theology speaks to how God reaches out to us, how God has a relationship with us, how he cares for us, how he forgives us, how he gives us life. Um, and so there's actually so much within one God, three persons, three persons, one God. Like, there's so much there. And um, we get a little snapshot of it here uh, in John chapter 10. Well, I, in uh, John 17, because it is a cohesive whole, uh, John 17, 17, Jesus prays, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Well, the Holy Spirit is the sanctifier. Um, then the next verse, uh, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So he is the good shepherd who sends his sheep into the world, but not alone. Uh, but understand there are other sheep out there who have a bad shepherd or bad shepherds, and they are wayward, and they are um, they can do things that are bad, but they're also lost. They're stuck in brambles and briars and ditches. Um, so, so then Jesus says, and for their sake I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in the truth or in truth. So that yes, it is, that's, the Trinity in action right there. So it all really should hold together. You can't know the voice of the shepherd unless the Holy Spirit gives you ears to hear. And the Holy Spirit, I would argue, is the one who carries that voice um, and creates and maintains. And then it, once you know the good shepherd, you also know the other sheep. Do you like sheep, Pastor Luke? Do you love sheep? Was it something like that at uh, Reverend uh, Tom King's installation at Trinity just a few weeks ago, uh, yeah. what did the other pastor say? Uh, the other pastor said, talking about when Peter, or when Jesus commended Peter to feed feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And the pastor said, uh, it's funny, Jesus didn't ask Peter if he liked sheep. <laughs> you got to feed them. <laughs> uh, sometimes sometimes uh, sheep are not likable. Uh, sometimes they bite. Sometimes they kick. Um, when you're trying to apply, uh, to apply a soothing salve they bite you (laughs) they make it worse yeah Yeah. um but we we look to the good shepherd um who took all of our all of our biting and kicking and bleeding bleating and shoving and shoving uh to the cross (laughs) bullheadedness man hey hey, we're gonna get the rest of this good shepherd stuff now that you yeah we're going to go to just the, the next verse for the funeral is 27 to 30, I believe. Yes. All right, well, let's, get to, let's, uh, to... let's jump to verses, verse 27. But there's more red words there. Red, finish out 17 and 18. I'd like to, it's red. I, I think you're going to skip the red, man. All right, 17. For this reason, the Father loves, uh, loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me because I lay down my, uh, where am I? But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So again, uh, more Trinitarian theology here. Um, I think there's also resurrection there. Yeah, well, the Father has sent Jesus on a mission, and um, but Jesus has authority to lay down his life, but to take it up again. Um, because Scripture speaks to each person in the Trinity raising Christ from the dead. The Father raised Christ from the dead. The Spirit the rose. Raised himself? The Son rose. I mean, he's saying it right here. All right. Uh, you took the t- class. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> Taking it up again and the Spirit bringing Christ uh, back to life. So all three persons were involved in the resurrection, which may seem obvious. But um, the Father didn't die. No. Neither did the Spirit. Okay. But did God die? That's what Time Magazine said in 1967. All right, uh, verse 27. Uh, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. 
My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. There are other voices coming out of that the yep. floor there. Yep. Okay. Well, I, I think we need some context here. Again, you're skipping the red letters. I'll read 25. <laughs> so there's this dispute. though. So, I mean, right before that, then we get this dispute because um, the Jews are upset that Jesus is saying he's the good shepherd. He's going to lay, he has authority to lay his life down, take it up again. Then we get the timing. Then the Jews come around verse 24. How long will you keep us in suspense? If you were the Christ, tell us plainly. And then Jesus says in 25, I told, uh, I told you, and you do not believe the works that I do in my father's name, bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Ouch. Jesus is not nice. Shame on Jesus. So he, some, some of the sheep don't, well, they're, they're not believing sheep. They don't listen. Well, they're not even, yeah, they're not Jesus' sheep. They're sheep, but they're not his sheep. Because yeah. they don't listen. Doesn't mean he doesn't love them. Correct. Yeah, it hurts to love them, though, I think. I mean, because he loves them, I think, is why he says, you're not my sheep. Because the unloving thing would be to pretend they were and then let them go destroy themselves. What I'm hearing in verse 27 then is obedience reveals God's sheep. To an extent. Um, we can't judge a person's heart. We can judge a person's behaviors. Um, so a Christian ought to look a certain way, ought to behave. Uh, Christians ought to do certain things and not do other things. Um, but <clears throat> now I was, we had a pastor meeting, uh, circuit meeting yesterday and he was talking with, it was spirited. Let me just uh, say that. Uh, but it was good. Uh, I was talking with one of the pastors That's why it was good. Cause it was spirited and he, he's doing a funeral today for a, a longtime Christian at his church. But this guy off and on struggled with alcoholism. He was estranged from his family, uh, all sorts of terrible things. And so, you know, by looking at his life, you could probably, I don't know if that guy's a Christian, uh, but this was a baptized member of his, his congregation and uh, who did faithfully attend. Um, so so there, there's kind of a, a, the danger of pietism is to think that my justification relies on how good I am living the Christian life. Um, <clears throat> which is one of the pitfalls of, of Christianity, specifically within Lutheranism, is pietism. Um, that, how do I know I'm a Christian? Well, I'm doing good works. Um, but the, the danger is in that places our salvation on what we do. Now, a Christian ought to do good work. A Christian needs to do good works. We're going through James, uh, the epistle readings right now, and James is pretty clear. Uh, good works cannot be separated from faith in Christ. So, um, good work. Uh, if you think about a human being, we have a horizontal relationship with God and no, vertical relationship with God and horizontal relationships with our neighbors and the rest of creation. Our good works do not belong in our horizontal, uh, vertical relationship with God. God doesn't need our good works. He doesn't need us. Uh, but our neighbor needs our good works. Um, and so uh, this is why Jesus, God, cares a lot about how we treat other people. <laughs> um Seven of the Ten Commandments have to do with loving our neighbor. Uh, and so uh, our good works are played out in our horizontal relationships with one another. So um, obedience, yes, very much a part of faith. But um, obedience is not assurance of faith. Because there are plenty of non-Christians that do pretty good things. Sometimes they're better at it than a lot of Christians are. It's for the fruit of faith. It's not the cause of faith. Yes, yes. Right? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's the result of faith. But the assurance of faith is not that you do works. It's that you believe that Christ. But 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 I will absolutely. I, I mean, I wouldn't have had quite the same. Re so I would agree. Like 
the fruits of faith follow. And when mm-hmm. Jesus says, you hear my voice, and they, you know them, and, and we as Lutheran Christians, I think, would articulate this. Well, I could tell you objectively, I heard Jesus' voice in baptism, and I still hear it. I hear it in, in word and sacrament. Uh, I hear it in my brothers and sisters in Christ encouraging me and reminding me of who Christ is and who I am in him. And then um, they follow me. That's discipleship. So to, to go the other way is not what a disciple should look like. Are you, is all hope lost? No. Repent. Get back on the road. Follow Jesus. So th- there, there is that tension where there, there, there's a temptation to go to pietism, which is to say, well, I, uh, I know I'm saved because I do all these good things. Or you could say, I'm so confident I'm saved, I don't have to do anything. Both of them are not, I don't think, the, the right answer. The right answer is follow Jesus. Yep. Listen to him. And when your ears are stopped up and you've gone the wrong way, repent and listen. So um, the, the choice, there's not an ultimate choice, we, we would say from a Lutheran perspective, but I would say a biblical perspective. The choice is never that I have decided to follow Jesus. That's why th- that is not in our hymnal. Uh, you could make a choice, if you want to argue it that way, to not follow him. But uh, but there is an, an active righteousness that is this what, that's what you were describing, Pastor Luke, about your yeah. neighbor does need your good works. Well, there are, in verses 27 and 28, there are, there are four verbs, and they, they go back and forth. So there's hearing, the sheep hear, Jesus knows, the sheep follow, and Jesus gives. So there's hearing the voice, Jesus knows the, uh, the sheep, uh, the sheep follow, they follow the voice, they follow the shepherd, and Jesus gives them eternal life. Um, and they're all present tense verbs, which is kind of interesting. But So there is this uh, back and forth uh, with the verbs here. You want me to check that to make sure that's well, true? I, I read that. In oh, you, you, you studied ahead of time. Yeah. See, I, I just show up. I don't. But preceding the hearing of the voice, preceding the sheep hearing the voice, the shepherd has to speak. You're getting really trippy now, man. Yeah. Um, I can't hear it if you don't speak it. Well, um, how are they to believe unless someone preaches? Exactly. The spoken word is really important. Even using your illustration, there's still obedience. Uh, whether you want to call it backsliding or, or sinning after, you know, you get absolution and then, you know, you're forgiven and then, you know, there might be a sickness depending on what it is. Uh, but then he repents again or she repents again. There still is an obedience that's going on. Yeah, absolutely. That reveals that he's a, a lamb, you know, a sheep. So there, there's, a, there isn't blatant uh, sinning going on there. Like, well, I, I know plenty of Christians that had a lot of blatant sin. Um, well, I think, I think uh, myself included, uh, when I walked into my apartment, I said some not appropriate church words. So, uh, uh, so please, I've had to me. restore you to the pastoral <laughs> ministry since then. Uh, I mean, absolutely. There is obedience. I mean, obedience is a huge part of the Christian life, and I think that's it's something, part of discipleship. Yeah, uh, I think that's something Lutherans tend to uh, get weak on. We do not preach and teach sanctification well. It's like you're at that meeting yesterday. Yeah, we we. I think we're afraid so much of the law because the law only kills. Well, God's law doesn't just kill. God's law is actually God's will for our lives, and I think in the last 50, 60 years, Lutherans have done a disservice to God's people by not preaching the law uh not 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 just to condemn but to exhort hey god's people do good works care for your neighbor love one another um no, but that's a, that's a, you, but, but it's like look you're over there in the ditch it's poison if you stay in there about another day you're gonna die let me i'm gonna pull you out of the ditch or get the heck out of the ditch i mean that is a that is a loving thing to do is it always comfortable no because you know we could just you know it'd be nice well it looks like they're in the ditch that's too bad I hope they get out someday. I mean, at some point there's an urgency. And, and, and this is where if, if just being nice and maintaining the status quo because we'd hate to upset anybody is the greatest good, 
then we're not going to get – I mean, we'll have something, but it's going to be really – we're going to be really boxed in. And again, as soon as I say that, because I struggled with this yesterday at this meeting, but that doesn't mean to be a jerk to people and yeah. go, get out of the ditch, you dummy. Get out. I mean, and then yell at them and never smile and have no humor. I mean, um, we shouldn't take ourselves too seriously. There's a humility because, look, maybe I've been in a ditch before too. And if I don't look out, I might end up in a ditch that's poison, either because I stupidly got into it or I was trying to fish out my latest trinket or gadget that I think I needed. Or maybe somebody knocked me into the ditch because they wanted to kill me. I don't know. So that is where the word of God is always a good thing. God's will is that we live and not die. And so part of that is don't kill yourself. Don't kill other people. Many times you're unwittingly killing yourself and other people. Don't do that either. But sometimes there are people who are psychopaths and messed up. And even Christians in their rage or anger think they're going to produce life. But as Pastor Luke alluded to through St. James, um, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I'm angry about this whole thing. My face is getting red. I'm excited. Oh. Hell, the, the way of sin is the way of death. And the way of obedience uh, is the way of life. God's law actually is... Obedience to God, not obedience, yourself. Obedience to God is the way of God's will, which is the way of life. Um, now, right. we, of course, we are not saved through our works. Or be, we are not saved through our obedience. Um, but it is the way of life because it's the way of God. God's will for us. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, the the following, the sheep following, is obedience. Like we we need to follow Jesus. We need to follow the good shepherd. We need to obey His word. Um, on a, on a very practical level, it's generally better for us when we obey God's word. When we obey God, it's better for me when you do. That. Yeah, when I'm not a jerk, you benefit from it. So uh, right. Uh, so does everyone yeah. else out here. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't need to yeah. tell them that. They know. Uh, that yeah. we look at ourselves through this mirror and show where it exposes the sin. Mm -hmm. But it also shows that we're never going to measure up. That, and it shows that we need <coughs> Absolutely. for that grace. Yeah. We need that good show. Okay? And so it's not that it's just a, you know, right in your face, you know, you're going to go to hell and you're never, you know, you're no good. But it's, it just shows that, you know, no matter how hard you try, you're not going to live up to the law here. So, so you know, quit trying so God got a heart and let give in to, to Jesus. You know, still do the things, the fruit of the Spirit, yeah. But don't beat yourself up over the law. You know? I, I would say you re the, the, uh, try as hard as you can, actually. Uh, because so you talked about the first and second use of the law. There's a third use of the law, which is a guide or a rule. Do it and do it as well as you can. So th that's what I'm saying. We, we tend to want to go, well, I, can't, I could never measure up. I I'm just no good. Uh, I'm just a sinner. I'm only human. When I say, no, you are human. You're creating God's image. You are a, you are a sheep of the good shepherd. Follow him as fiercely as you can. Now, there will be times that you mess up. But don't set out to mess up or set yourself up for failure or excuse ahead of time failure. Well, I'm going to go ahead and do this sin because I know I'll be forgiven. Because because we will, we are tempted, I am, to justify myself in anything and everything. And and so I can find a lot of creative ways to justify not following Jesus because I'm so faithful to Jesus and know that I'm forgiven. That's why I'm not going to follow him because that's how, I'm that good of a Christian. See, and, it, and, it, and I can lie to myself and I can lie to you. So... So I would say God's, the word of God is a good thing. It is, it is sharper than a, a, a two-edged sword, right? So it cuts, and, and, and it's never not true that we should follow Jesus. We should always follow Jesus. So I think that's the exciting part. I mean, at a funeral, I mean, I don't reckon I hash all this out of the funeral. <laughs> right? but, well, because here's the thing. When you're dead, you can't follow Jesus at all. So he's the one who has taken you from death to life. And he is the good shepherd who um, is going to carry me from death to life. And, but it's not just me. And so then the stained glass window that has Peggy Rohde as a little lamb <laughs> and whoever else, because not just Peggy. Um, th there's, there's another lamb there. And then there are other sheep. So it, it's always about Jesus. And the temptation is to not listen to his voice, to make being a Christian about anything but actually following Jesus. And I would say it's always to follow Jesus. I don't have strong feelings about it. I just, 
I'm glad Bob brought this up. Now, Peggy's <laughs> had her hand up. Paul had his hand up at some point. I was, as I looked at this, I'm looking at it from the point before Bob is seeing it, I'm, where it says, um, the miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. And, and I think it kind of goes to your sermon a couple weeks ago. Problem is the heart, right. you know. Part of the matter is the matter of the heart, kind of a thing, that they they couldn't follow him. They wouldn't follow him because they had not accepted him as who he said he was or accepted his word. Their hearts were hard. And so it's all a matter of God, the Holy Spirit's work, creating in them a heart that will accept. And not to say that these people could not become sheep at some point, but at this point, yeah, and I would say, I would probably, I don't know that I would use the term accept, not to say it's wrong. Well, I would say believe, trust. You don't believe I am who I am. You don't believe that I am the son of God. You don't believe that I'm the good shepherd. You don't believe that I am the Messiah that the father has sent. Uh, and he's saying, look, I did all these other things. You still don't believe the main thing, though. You believe I can turn um, five loaves of bread into a feast for thousands, but you don't believe that I actually am going to lay down my life and take but it I, up again. I am the bread of life. Yeah. You don't believe that like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, the son of man will also be lifted up so that you will be saved, not just from a snake that is your punishment, but from the wages of sin, which is death. So yeah, it, it all ultimately comes down to believing and then back to the, the Trinity. So this is the work of God that you believe. And how does that done? Well, the Holy Spirit is the one that does this and puts you into the sun. Paul. The law it. shows love. Also. Just setting parameters to protect. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, I've, I've been thinking this whole time that verse 25, in, in a sense, is a good parenting verse. Hmm. You know? I'm sure Troy never goes through this. <laughs> I'm pretty low-key, but yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, I told you. You know, it's all, it's, I knew this was going to happen, and yeah. now I see it happen. Yeah. I'm and, even more I mean, mad. In a sense, that's what Jesus is telling him. He's just, you know, come to I told you, but you just you don't believe it. You know, and and just thinking about, you know, years ago, my kids, just like, oh, my goodness. You know, I probably, if, if neighbors saw me, they probably thought, that guy is, he is mean. <laughs> you know, but... You know, there was a, 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 there was one time Heidi just she just took off down the driveway in her bike and didn't look either way and just flew right out in the middle of the street. You know, and I got I got on my bike and I chased her down. You know, and brought her back, almost pulled her by the ear, trying to explain to her why she can't do that. You know, I didn't do it because I didn't love her, but you never knew when a truck. Car, whatever, come around the corner. Well, because, because you did, rather than you did. Yeah, because you love it. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, that's why I say the, the law shows love. You know, this is what you, you don't do. And you, and you know, Troy, you're talking about, you know, the ditch thing. It's just like, okay, you got yourself down the ditch, and they're going to pull you out again. <laughs> I hate this. <laughs> well, sometimes I like the just, ditch. You know, yeah. it, yeah. 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 And, and that's, you know, Christ cares for us. He has that law. You know, yeah. Uh, you hate having to do it, but oh. Well, the, the law is, uh, God gives us the Ten Commandments, not because he wants to squash our fun or whatever. Like, he, he gives us the law to protect us. Um, well, post-fall into sin, he get, the law is given to protect us. Because the, the law of God is good and wise. Yes. The way of sin is death. It will lead to death. Um um, it is, I mean, you know, you think, think about the, the fourth commandment, uh, it is to set boundaries on how we, uh, our relationship with our parents, uh, to obey them, to love them, respect them. Uh, the sixth commandment, you know, sex is a great and wonderful gift that God has given us, but it's meant for marriage outside of that. It, it destroys us. Uh, and so, and God, he knows this, he knows that sin destroys us. It destroys his children, uh, his 
created human beings and it breaks his heart. And um, so the law is meant for our good. And uh, it doesn't, because of our sinfulness, it doesn't feel good all the time. Like grabbing Heidi by the ear probably did not feel good for her, but it was for her good. Um, when, when the law, when God, God's word, when God does surgery on us through, through the law with the scalpel of the law, it can hurt. We test, it gives you a heart transplant. Yeah. Uh, he is cutting out the sin. He's cutting out the cancer. It, uh, it does not feel good. When, when God reveals an idol to me, it's like, oh boy, that, ugh, I really am a mi poor, miserable sinner. doesn't feel good, but, uh, to, to then repent of sin and receive God's forgiveness, the grace uh, from the good shepherd and to strive uh, uh, to follow, follow and obey God. Uh, it is a better way. Uh, there's a, a, I think he's Presbyterian, uh, a theologian, Stanley Hauerwas. He talks about the Christian life. He says, don't take yourselves too seriously. Enjoy getting the idols and sin beat out of your life. <laughs> uh, so to kind of have some humor about it, like, yep, uh, yeah, as, apartment as, got burned up. Uh, yeah. Uh, I threw away a bunch of idols. Apparently. That's right. You got burned up. <laughs> uh, they are in the dumpster now. <laughs> this room probably have, have, had heard at one point or another, especially the males, this is going to hurt you more, hurt me more than it hurts you. Yeah. Right. I wasn't yeah. sure when I was eight years old that was true, <laughs> but yeah. I never did use it on my children because I, I, I never agreed with it, but I, I understand the premise. <laughs> well, I was thinking when you were talking about with Heidi, it would be better that she enter into or live the rest of her life without an ear than to be smashed on the hood of a car and be dead, right? So, I mean, Jesus says this about it. would be better for you to enter into eternal life without an eyeball than to burn up. <laughs> well, right. Well, but I'm just, uh, you know, just to push it. But, but it is, th th there is... But I will say, in terms of the proper distinction of law and gospel, which is important for us. So the law says, do this, right? It, it, never, sa it never says, it always says, do this. And if you're in a 99, that's not good enough. You need 100. And so the law will calibrate things so we can see them rightly. But just because you, you've realized, oh, I was upside down, now I'm right side up, that doesn't necessarily make you feel better. So it's the gospel then that says, believe this. It has already been done for you. So the law is a good thing. But the law, just knowing what the law is, is only half of this. It's all God's stuff. It's all God's will. The gospel says, believe this. It's already been done for you. So when I am convicted of I was living, I was going you know, east when I should have been going west, and I'm turned around, well, just because I'm now facing west doesn't move me to where I'm supposed to be. So the gospel then is, believe this. It's already been done for you, and God is doing this. So we don't, we don't pit the two against one another. They're not at war. It's all God's will. Right? God's will is that you live and not die. So part of that is, first of all, get out of the ditch. Stop going the wrong way. But then how do you live? Well, you believe. So Jesus is the one who came not to do away with the law. He says this himself. He does not do away with the Ten Commandments. He doesn't give a new law. He says, I came to fulfill the law. And you should live this law too. And when you don't, believe that I am the one who has fulfilled it, but never stop following me. Never. So how hard should you try to keep the Ten Commandments? As hard as you can. I hope that you keep them better today than you did yesterday. For your sake and for my sake. The same is true for me. So this is where the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And part of maturing in the faith is that hopefully you're going to be a more faithful Christian. Now, does it always, there's still going to be ups and downs. But I hope that I have grown in some wisdom and I don't keep repeating those things. But when I mess up, what do I do? Lord, have mercy. I'm sorry. And then I believe that for Christ's sake, I'm forgiven. Rick Kerr had his hand up. Preach it, brother. I don't have enough time to preach. Well, you got, you got it roughly five minutes. Arlene will let you know when you're out. I, when I read the Gospels, I'm always putting myself in the position of the people who are hearing what Jesus says and realizing that they don't know what I know because I'm post-Pentecost. And so I try to figure out what are they hearing. And of course, Jesus speaks in their shepherding language because that's what they know. But it, it's very difficult for them to perceive what he's really saying. And yet, then I move out to Paul's letters. And I think Paul spends almost every letter trying to explain law and gospel 
to people who are post-Pentecost, and they still don't get it. I think the, the difficulty for us is that that line between living by works, living by faith, and then following in faith, such a fine line that it's hard to explain to people where that line is, because unless they've experienced the line, they don't, they don't really see it, and, and they don't quite get it. And I was thinking earlier, we were talking about the law. You know, the law, if the law were not present, we'd all be doomed because nothing would show me my unworthiness if there were no law. And I know that people think it would be wonderful to live without the law, but in reality, we'd survive it about a day, yeah. and then things would be awful from then. But it's just such a fine line between, I live for Jesus, but I can't tell you why. You know, it's the, why do I have, well, I don't know. It's just because the faith is in my heart, it drives me. To live that way and it also reminds me when I've gone off the path every day it reminds me all the time when I'm on that's that curve mm -hmm. when I'm off the path and where I'm supposed to go yeah but it's such a fine line that it's it's difficult I think it's difficult to preach <laughs> it's a very difficult line to find when you're standing up there preaching a message to a diverse congregation yeah and it's um there there's always uh, the danger to to turn the good things of God into an idol and the law of God we can easily turn into an idol and we make it this is how I'm saved or my I turn my good works into self-righteousness or I thank God that I'm not like this tax collector uh, we we, uh, we turn doing good works we turn God's law into an idol and we could we all can do that very easily um, but then we can also go the, the route of antinomianism where the law doesn't matter uh, which is Worshiping it makes another, me feel bad, so I don't yeah, like it. Worshiping another idol. Um, so, yeah, it's it's always dancing between these two ditches uh, and uh, living by faith and striving to live out that faith in obedience to to the Good Shepherd. But, yeah, it's, I mean, it's the life of, life of the Christian. Um, it's an adventure. <laughs> uh, Bob and then Paul. Yeah, we talked about the love is law, and, uh, it, you know, we try to wrap our our mind around love and God and God's love and love for the lost people led the father to ask his son to go to the cross. Yeah. And that in itself is, is huge. And in love for the flock and the father, the son went. Mm -hmm. and, and that is just, you know, just hard for us to wrap our minds around. Because mm -hmm. I don't think any of us we're not, we're all not all God. I don't think any of us would ever ask our son to do that. To, to die for a bunch of ungrateful sheep. <laughs> well, I, see, I, see, I wonder when you said, did he ask him? I don't think he asked him. I think he told him, this is what you need to do. See, and this, this is a parenting thing between me and Andrea at times. Andrea will ask the kids to do things at times. I said, just tell them, don't ask them. Cause I don't care if you just ask. Cause if you ask me to do something, Hey, will you do this? Yeah, I'm willing to do it. Do you want me to do it? So, I, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm being a slightly flip, but I've, I've gotten worse in this in the last <laughs> six months for some reason. Uh, so I'm gotten worse, not better, but I think, see, he is perfectly obedient. The father tells the son to do this and he, he, he may, uh, man, I'm not. All right. Nevertheless, not my will. I don't yeah. think Jesus, it's not a question. Do you want to do this? It's just do it. And, and that's because the law doesn't ask us to do things. It's not about, hey, you know what might be a good idea, Bob, if you did this? It's just do it. Um, it that uh, relationship, though, mm -hmm. doesn't he, when he says, but not my will, but yeah. your will. Be yeah, but it's, it, you to told me to do this, Dad, and because you're my dad and I'm your son, I'm going to do it. And, and, and that's, like, I, I know, though, it's a difference in approach between me and my wife at times because she will ask. I, mean, I don't ask. I'll just do it. Have that same response? I, I don't really. I, I, I think when it comes down to questions of motivation, I don't. I, I'm perhaps I'm a little too simple in this respect. I don't know that I always care what people's motivation is. Like, seriously, I want people to come to church. If you're scared that you're going to burn in hell, come to church. If you're delighted to come to church, come to church. I mean, I do care, but I don't care. So. I would rather you do something unwillingly than not do it at all. I think. I don't know, but that's the. Uh, 
Paul, you had your hand up. Uh, another part of the law thing is the law just doesn't help to protect me. It also protects others from me. Yes. yes. So I was thinking like as a teacher, you know, how many times stand out in this hallway and, and you tell the eighth grader, don't run down the hallway. You know, right. And their their immediate thought is, well, what's going to I'm not I can run down this That's hallway, right. you know. It's not about you. You're going to run <laughs> down the hallway just fine without getting hurt. I trust that you can get from, and I would tell them, right. I know you can get from the music room to the eighth grade room and never get hurt running. That's not the problem. But what about I Mr. Said, Kerr? What, what <laughs> happens when, you know, the third grader steps out of the door mm-hmm. and you run him over? Yeah. Oh, I didn't think about that part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so the law protects the others from yeah. us, too. Yeah. 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 A, lot, a lot of times obedience and sanctification all that isn't just i mean it's not even about me it's about those around me um yeah Yeah, psalm 119 talks about this blessed are those whose ways blameless who walk in the law of the lord blessed are those who keep his testimonies so you're saved when you do this uh it is a good thing alan then we're gonna wrap up okay um yeah in in uh, god giving us the uh, the law he it also says we he knows what we would do first of all we would Pay attention to him and all the things of, of the law he knew ahead of time. And that's why one of the reasons why he's given that to us is that he knows what's going to happen and he's, he's warning us to some extent. Yeah. Amen. All right, let's, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are merciful, that you are slow to anger, and yet abounding in steadfast love. Part of your love for us is not leaving us without uh, clarity, uh, responsibility, or purpose. You reveal that in and through your law, and yet we also are convicted that we don't keep it perfectly. By faith, we trust, though, that there is one who has kept it perfectly, who still holds on to us, who was crucified for our transgressions, and yet... Um, when he said it is finished, um, we trust in that by faith, but we also rejoice that he is raised from the dead. And as he reigns uh, from now unto eternity, um, we know that he watches over us, that he goes with us wherever we go, um, and he holds on to those saints who have gone before. So bless us and keep us today and always as we seek to faithfully listen to and obey the voice of Jesus, our good shepherd, in whose name we pray. Amen.